Um, thank you to Southwest Fire Science Consortium for this invitation to present today. So I'm really excited to share this information. Um, good morning or afternoon to you, depending on where you are listening in today. And I'm happy to be able to present this research from the Arizona Sky Islands. And first of all, I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors, Bill Block, Joe Ganey, Pepe Anigas, and Sam Cushman. So the Sky Islands are a biodiversity hotspot named for the desert sea with mountain islands in southeastern Arizona spanning into Mexico. And thinking about on the U.S. side in Arizona, there's about 13 sky islands, and that's going to be the focus of this talk today. Not only is there a latitudinal gradient, there's also an elevational gradient within the mountains, which results in a diversity of vegetation types that support a large num number of animal species. And in particular, the focus of this talk will be on the avian species. Now there are many unique birds that have species ranges overlapping with the Sky Island region, even some that have the northernmost part of their range in southeastern Arizona. And the region has one global and three state important bird areas and birders from around the country flock, no pun intended, region for bird watching opportunities leading to a vibrant ecotourism economy. And here are just a few notable species here. So one of my favorites here is the elegant trogon, notable for their vibrant plumage. And they're also part of the northern mark most part of their range in southeastern Arizona and found primarily in riparian areas. Um, the buff-breasted flycatcher is a species found in recently burned areas on a few mountains. Uh, the Mexican chickadee, yellow-eyed junco, both are endemic species found, found only on a few mountain ranges. And then finally here, the red-faced warbler found in high elevation mixed conifer. Now, not a lot is known about habitat relationships of many of the conservation species, and even more is unknown about response to disturbance, mainly fire, for these species in the region. Now, to back up a little bit, uh, the hypothesis of pyrodiversity promoting species diversity encompasses the idea that landscapes with a greater heterogeneity in time since fire, scale, or size, severity, and vegetation types will support a greater diversity of species. And pyrodiversity has been shown to promote avian diversity, for example, in the California conifer forest, but this is not always the case, um, pulling from this example in southeastern Australia. Now birds are often selected as indicators of forest conditions based on their reliance on forest structure for food and nesting requirements. And the increased ability to sample more than one species at a time also makes them more efficient indicators of changes in biodiversity. And disturbance plays an important role in the conservation of birds by creating landscape heterogeneity. And we assume that increased overall species richness will occur due to the mosaic of patches that are created with different uh, vegetation communities and thus different bird communities. And we can make some predictions on what species we expect to see based on severity and time since fire, based on their life histories and published literature. And at each stage of time since disturbance, we, we're going to expect there to be winners and losers of each stage. So when you think of after a burn occurs in the initial time, um, when herb cover starts to increase, we expect bark and wood foragers like the hairy woodpecker pictured here to do well. Increased insect activity after the burn also tends to lead to increased activity from aerial insectivores, like this ash-throated flycatcher. And then cavity nesters also do well from increased snags and in the increased cavities that occur post-burn. 
Now, as time elapses after disturbance, the transition to young forests with snags falling and developing un understory, you tend to see omnivores and shrub nesters that favor this kind of habitat, like the chipping sparrow pictured here. And then as time elapses more, we see mature forests with few snags, closed canopy and low understory development. And that's when you see closed canopy nesters like the red-faced warbler and Grace's warbler pictured here, as well as foliage gleaners that do well. And finally, you transition to old growth with snags and open canopies and other bird species tend to favor those so essentially at each stage you're going to see winners and losers based on their requirements. So for this talk we're going to be focusing on a few montane vegetation types that vary, tend to vary by elevation and that leads to different bird communities by vegetation type. So to go through these, the first one including conifer woodland which is the pinyon juniper, historically infrequent fires in this type. Uh, next, pine oak, where you think about chihuahua pine, apache pine, ponderosa pine, and silver leaf oak, Arizona oak. Um, historically frequent low severity fire. And then moving on to broadleaf evergreen, also called madrain oak woodlands. Uh, a lot of different oak species like silver leaf oak, emery oak, white oak. And the historical frequency is largely unknown, but the, a lot of the species that occur do re-sprout quickly, suggesting adapt, adaptations. And then moving on to ponderosa pine, frequent low severity fire, then mixed conifer, where you have Doug, Douglas white and white fir, and ponderosa pine and white pine and historically frequent mixed severity fire. And then um, also gonna be talking about deciduous forests or classifying as aspen or oak, and then conifer, riparian, typically Arizona cypress. So my colleagues, Bill Block and Joe Giney, initiated the original study in the 90s looking at habitat relationships of birds within these vegetation types across five different mount mountain ranges um, and with over 300 point count station visited over the breeding season for five years so pretty substantial project in the 90s and from this study we found differences in species richness by vegetation cover type. And more specifically, uh, broadleaf evergreen or the madrain oak woodland and conifer woodland or pinyon juniper had the highest species richness and deciduous forests had the lowest species richness during this time period. And we also saw increasing species richness with the more southern mountain ranges like the Huachucas the Santa Rita's and the Chiricahua's compared to the other two. And to orient yourself to the, the key there, the circles being the Chiricahua Mountains and onward. And then during this time period, this five year time period, very little disturbance occurred as we expect to see very low levels of local extinction and colonization or species turnover. So this is a picture of both colonization and extinction. And however, we did see deciduous forests ha had increased turnover, which is likely associated with this vegetation cover type being more rare on the landscape. And another thing to point out with these results is that um, in the Pinaleño Mountains where, co where colonization was greater than extinction, there was a fire event that occurred later on in the original study within this cover type. So fast forwarding a bit to 2011, a group of concerned citizens and business owners aware of this original study requested 
that Rocky Mountain Research Station scientists assess impacts of recent wildfires on the bird species, which is sparked by the Horseshoe 2 fire that occurred in the Cherokee Mountains, and that burned over 200,000 acres. Um, resilience of bird communities are important to state and local economies that rely heavily on this ecotourism. So in fact, thinking about all the mountain ranges, more than 80% of the points burned at some severity during the time period between the original study and then. Thus, we embarked on a quest to resample vegetation and bird communities at the same locations with funding from Desert LCC during 2014 for all the mountain ranges. And we did sample the chair for 2012 and 13 as well. So looking at the history of those specific islands between samples, there were nine fires that burned portions of the transect within the mountain ranges over that 20 year time period or span. And uh, Wachuca's had a really small fire, so that was mainly unburned on our transects. And I wanted to point out that some areas did burn twice, like the Chiricahuas and the Santa Catalina. Now we're using Bayesian hierarchical models to model both the true biological processes. So these are what we typically think of what we're really interested in, but we're accounting for the sampling processes so that we aren't biasing any of results for management decisions. So thinking about the different processes, there's essentially three steps in this hierarchy. We have species that are available in the regional pool. And if they're in that pool, you can model occupancy or their presence based on different covariates like habitat or burn severity. And then given their presence, then we can model what we actually observe when we sample and account for differences in detection. A big one being with species, um, more rare species might be more difficult to detect. And then with this process, we can go also get estimates of species richness and local colonization and extinction and account for imper imperfect detection with these models. So to sample birds, observers record all species that they see and hear at specific point count locations during a fixed amount of time. And then we, we also use the same protocols from the 90s to resample vegetation with four hectare plus. And to give you an idea of what, what's happening on the landscape, I have a series of pictures here going through the different vegetation types and burn severities. So mixed conifer unburned. Um, this is pretty amazing. We we refound points with no GPS. So this predates GPS. So we use notes and topo maps here. And going on to Madrean oak woodlands, low severity, you don't see much change. And then with the moderate severities, when you start to see more of the changes, and this is within Ponderosa Pine, and then high severity, and this is in Pinion Juniper Woodland. So quickly looking at raw detections, on a, not adjusted for detection, we did see some differences between the 90s and 2014. Um, some of this could be two to five years of sampling versus one year sampling, where rare species are often only detected one out of the five years, so pretty infrequently. And we didn't sample all of the, the points due to uh, safety concerns in 2014 with the burned areas. And there were a few species like thick-billed parrot that we only saw in the 90s were pretty interesting. So the first part of the modeling going to go over looking at the differences between the 90s and 2014 and we used a model on only species that we observed and basically looking at 
time period and differences in species and a different analysis by mountain range. And overall, there were no differences uh, accounting for um, credible intervals with species richness. So it overlapped for the mountain ranges, but there were differences in posterior year medians. And more specifically, um, mountain ranges with lower values of burn severity at the point level had larger differences between the time periods. And these also are the Huachucas, which are the most southern versus the most northern range as well. So there's, there's suggest to be some differences between species rich, richness, although the credible intervals overlap. So although species richness was similar, there was evidence of species turnover. And this shows, this uh, graph here shows the difference between colonization and extinction, that differences, uh, whereby more weight to the left indicates that extinction is greater than colonization. Um, and the y-axis is the number of species where that occurs. And so specifically, the Santa Rita's and the Huachuca's Pinolanos all had more weight on the left. And some of the species included in there were low elevation species. And I did want to highlight a couple um, bird species specifically and what's going on. And there's a lot more to the story here, but I thought this was interesting with the buff-breasted flycatcher, which are typically associated with fire landscapes is um, detected in, or more uh, colonization was greater than extinction in the Pinulanos com compared to the Santa Rita's and the Huachuca's, which had less fire on the landscape. And this suggests a potential species expansion. Um, and then another species associated with fire landscapes is, uh, is the olive-sided flycatcher. And the, again, in the Chiricahuas did have fire in the landscape and colonization was greater than extinction there versus the Huachucos on our transects where there was no fire. So gonna dive into a little bit more into the effects of fire and specifically looking at the 2014 data subset. And this is again only on species observed. And looking, and I'm going to talk about the fire effects at multiple scales here. And specifically, burn severity at the point, so more a local scale, and then what we're terming landscape with fire on the land or transect, and then time since fire, and then time since fire squared. And I did put this picture in here. Um, that time matters here. And this is a high severity patch on the top, which is less than five years versus high severity, greater than 20 years. And that's a huge difference when you're thinking about forest structure and birds and how it's important to include those, both those components. So looking at fire on the transect at the landscape scale, we do see species that responded positively, 11 species, including hairy woodpecker, broad-tailed hummingbird. These are species that do need fire landscapes and potentially forage at a lar larger scale. Then there were a few species that responded ne negatively. And then looking at burn severity, at the point scale, there were species that responded positively, um, like the western wood peewee, ash voted flycatcher, and then also species that responded negatively. And Grace's warbler, red faced warbler, those are species that really need those closed canopy for, for nesting purposes. So the, these results were as expected. And then looking at time since fire, um, early, what we're terming middle and leader, um, 
there were species that responded differently at, at those different uh, time periods. For instance, the earlier part, like the ladder-backed woodpecker, and then you see more of the shrubby species later on, the spotted toey. In this graph here, there's a lot going on. Um, is looking at species richness by cover type, and then the different colors indicating the mountain range, and then the X and Y axes are time since fire, and then severity, and the Z axis being species richness. And so what, what you can see overall here is there's a lot of variation by all those factors. And the next couple slides are gonna dig in deeper um, within these components. So first of all, looking at the mixed conifer cover type, um, I wanted to point out this edge here that's marked that, that says no fire. Uh, that is what you can use to compare to results that did not have fire. So you can treat those more as a baseline uh, compared to the other ones that are in that 3D space. And what you can see is that mountain range matters as well as the severity and time since fire. And there is a lot of variation there. Um, specifically with this cover type, uh, there, with fire, um, there was, you know, a little bit lower species richness. And I thought it would be good to put these results into perspective with, with, uh, and with tying in some current work by co-authors showing that the current fire regime within this region diverges from the historical frequent mixed severity fires and that the size and the frequency of high severity fire has increased. So um, if it wasn't diverging, diverging, you might see a different result in species richness, essentially. So moving on to ponderosa pine, um, there was a trend when you're, you're looking at the comparison of no fire to with species richness being Again, a lot of variation, a little bit higher with fire versus not. And then looking at pine oak, uh, species richness tend to be higher with fire, both severity and time since fire compared to no fire, a lot of variation again. And again, to put this, these results into perspective, the current fire regime within this cover type within the region is similar from the historical frequent low severity fires. Moving on to madrain oak, um, species richness was about the same, a lot of you know, variation in areas that burn versus not. And again, perspective, the uh, co-authors found that the current fire regime within this region diverges from the historical frequent fires and that there is a fire deficit. So we might expect potentially increased species richness if there was more fire on the landscape within this type. And finally, looking at conifer woodland, the pinion juniper, there was a lot of variation, maybe slightly lower with fire compared to no fire. And again, historically infrequent fires within this cover type. So in conclusion, what we saw in general, that there were winners and losers depending on a variety of factors. And this landscape fire mosaic with the pyrodiversity hypothesis we're starting to see um, some consistency there with the hypothesis. Um, with time since fire, scale, severity, and vegetation type. And finally, when we view 
the species richness results, we see the importance of historical and current fire regimes in targeting where there is divergence and explaining potential differences in species richness with and without fire. And these are areas that we can think about targeting for potential restoration work and has implications potentially for overall biodiversity. And this leads in to some exciting research coming down the pipeline. We've assembled a core group of folks to extend this research beyond the U.S. footprint by leveraging similar but separate efforts on both sides of the border that to sample birds and vegetation during similar time periods. So this is really exciting research and glad to be working with these folks. Um, and what we are planning to be doing is exploring historical and current fire regimes, island biogeography, uh, climate, land use, uh, elevational gradients and how these factors influence bird and vegetation communities spanning the Madrean ecoregion. And this is a nice picture here of the transects that from both of these separate studies um, spanning uh, the U.S. and Mexico. So exploring uh, several different factors of interest. And so with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, various funding sources, uh, Desert LCC, uh, Rocky Mountain Research Station, and of course, all our field crews with collecting point count and vegetation data to support this research. Uh, Friends of Cape Creek Canyon helped out with our citizen science portion and Coronado National Forest and all the all the support from all these other organizations. And looks like we have lots of time for questions here. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much for a great presentation. You really covered a lot of uh, information in a concise way and uh, very interesting story uh, under through it all. So thank you. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. So please feel free to type questions uh, in the chat window. And uh, I think there, there are few, few enough of us that you can unmute yourself if you'd like, if you prefer to ask a question uh, verbally over the phone or, or um, over the computer. Um, and I guess, you know, our, uh, the first question came in before you even got started. Sort of David, I think what drew him to the webinar was to learn about uh, bird species and population recovery after fire. And I think uh, you, you've basically covered that, um, but I don't, didn't know whether there was, you know, if you want to sort of put an additional comment on it from that kind of, um, I don't know, sort of uh, key, that's a, one of the key points here. Uh, so um, Jamie, I don't know if you want to add anything around that. Sure, I, I think that's um, one of our fundamental questions is, is uh, or are these bird communities recovering after fire to what we might expect pre-fire conditions? And in some cases, we're seeing similar species richness, um, but we really, I should preface this, this is really our kind of first or second cut at these data. It's very complex data set with lots of moving parts, but um, we do want to dive into that. What, what does that mean to, to recover uh, for a dynamic system? Um, lots of unanswered questions there. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, and then uh, Carolyn asked uh, why you use time since fire squared in the model as opposed to presumably just time since fire. Right, so time since fire um, is getting at just positive, negative, but there also might be those species that respond more in the middle part of the time since fire. So that gets at those species, um, the quadratic formula. 
so just trying to understand myself so that would be species that it it's not a an immediate response but it's also not a long-term response is that a fair way exactly. to put it? exactly okay. and we we do expect some species to fall into that middle portion where you might not see them as much in the beginning or more near the end and some like sh shrub uh, nesters are one type of species that you might see more in the middle portion. Well that component is still on the landscape before it, it sort of changes due to succession, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Let's see, and then um, uh, Arana asked, um, is there oh, any way to control for the probability uh, differing abilities of field text to detect numbers of bird species in different fire severity areas. So that sort of um, measurement issue of different people going out to detect for birds. And mm -hmm. so she has an example in a dog hair thicket, the visibility of a researcher might be different from her. Oh, I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm misinterpreted, I'm sorry. Her example makes it more clear. In a dog hair thicket, the visibility of the researcher might be different from a relatively open clearing. So the difference just fire severity having an impact on your ability to detect birds. Right, and that's a very important point and it, it is something that we can include. I, I do have to say that m the majority of the detections in this study are by ear instead of visual because a lot of the vegetation is thick. <laughs> so it, it is very difficult to see the birds, um, but there are ways to account for those differences. And I'd say the bigger difference and what we have used in the model is by observer compared to by habitat. Um, yeah. Great. Um, and Pete asks, uh, how you would expect climate change to interact with habitat and fire. And so the kind of corollary is should managers be, post, be planning for post-fire recovery to pre-fire habitat or should they be thinking about new habitat? And I'm guessing that even over the time period uh, of this study, the 90s and the, uh, the teens, you, there's, there's, there was some change in, in average temperatures, et cetera. So you may have seen some of this already. Right, and you know, that's, that's a great question. Um, obviously we can use historical information as a baseline, uh, but we do need to account for the potential of not seeing something we've ever seen before. Um, and and understanding what that variability is in the past does give us some information on, you know, the species, how they can respond in the future with that variability. Um, and I, I'm not sure if I answered that specifically. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it, it's uh, a pretty, uh, pretty difficult question to answer sort of um, in general. So I, I, I I think that's that's good and and I have to say the the research team that we're working on um, right now and that's one of our fundamental questions that we're hoping to tackle more in depth um, as well so that's coming down the pipeline more great, great. Um, and uh, David has asked if there's a printed and quotable version of the material that could be used in a publication featuring birds. Um, and I'm, I'm assuming you there's a, um, you're pretty sure there's already a journal article, right? There, there is one from the 90s. Uh, we do have a few publications from the citizen science effort um, in the chair palace. And let's see, the bulk of the latter part of the presentation has not been published yet. So portions of it have been. Okay, great. And um, yeah, maybe uh, David, I'll, I'll 
well, I'll put some resources in the chat window here um, in a little minute so that you can you can follow up because I, I think it is interesting information to share with a more general audience, maybe more focused on burgers. Um, is that is any work on that sort of dissemination to the birding community happened yet, Jamie? Uh, yeah, um, I've presented some of this research at some bird conferences, um, some local and some more uh, national as well. Oh, great. And and also um, with the more citizen science aspect and, and sharing how folks could get involved down in the Sky Islands as well. Oh, that's great. Let's see, any other questions? And again, if you want to unmute your mic and, and speak up, that's okay too. Great, well, I'm not seeing any, anything else come in. Um, uh, so I think we can, we can wrap up here. Um, I really appreciate everybody uh, getting on the call today. Um, and particularly, Jamie, a great presentation. Thank you for sharing this. Um, and I think, you know, this, this wildlife connection, wildlife interaction with fire um, is something I personally feel like I don't know enough about. And so if there are folks on this call who have other uh, good research to share in this vein, uh, please, please let me know. Um, my email is xander at forestgill.org and we can maybe get it on a future webinar. Uh, so with that, thank you again, Jamie, and I uh, hope to see you all on a future webinar. Yeah, thank you, everyone.